Hello, gorgeous. Hello, Simone. It is wonderful to be here with you today. And what I wanted to talk about today was just a thought that came to me in sort of the, the younger groups where I'm like, these are like the cool, competent, younger people I know. And this trend I see of austerity is the new hedonism. And then I started to think about this line more. And I was like, well, let's, let's elaborate on this. It is voluntary austerity is the new involuntary hedonism. And when I brought this to you, something that you pointed out that I thought was really interesting is that hedonism is always involuntary. And austerity is always voluntary. Hmm. To have less due to reasons outside of your control is just poverty. Yes. It's not austerity. Austerity is intentional self-regulation. Whereas with hedonism, because it is being driven by your internal instincts, things that you did not choose to want to feel, it is always a thing that you are approaching outside of your controls. Would you like to know more? So I wanted you to elaborate on this topic in terms of how it relates to the world today and, and, and social status. Yeah. And I do think that there are different layers to this because some of the layers are just new forms of hedonism, I would argue. And I mean, I'd even argue- Elaborate on what you mean by that. Give some examples. Yeah. Well, I mean, I would argue that the dopamine hit that I get from saving money is similar to the dopamine hit that many people get from spending money. And whereas spending money like really stresses me out. (laughs) So I don't know about this. Like one of your favorite shows these days, so people who don't know this, she talks about it all the time. It's like- (laughs) Her core guilty pleasure show right now is a show where people put money into envelopes. Explain this. No, 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 no. Actually, my my favorite current YouTube binge is Caleb Hammer's channel. She, he interviews people like he has guests on who need help with their finances, typically because they're in crippling debt and really spending their money poorly. And then he creates new, very austere spending programs for them and budgets and talks about how like, well, for the next like year, you're not going to go out and eat to eat. You're not going to do anything fun at all. You're going to work up, you know, a ton to pay off all this insane debt so that you can get back to a good place. And I just find it insanely comforting, but I did discover this after actually do it. Yeah. Well, and and he has people on like six months later sometimes to do follow-ups and it does seem very, it's very unusual for somebody to have actually. And what happens to them? Have they like lost all their stuff? Have things foreclosed on them or are they just getting more Um, debt? Some of the people have have in follow-ups improved their behavior a little bit, but just not a lot. Like they're still spending more than they should be. They're not following their budget. But a lot of people are showing up and, you know, even in their early 20s with insane amounts of debt on really dumb stuff, like they bought a Tesla totally on finance that they have no ability to pay off. Um, and um, they just kind of, uh, I've been noticing a lot of Americans use credit cards the way that we would use like an exclusively for fun budget, meaning that like, as long as I have a limit on my credit card and I can keep spending it, I can spend this on whatever I want and I can Mm -hmm. go take my friends out to dinner. I can travel, I can take a cruise and that's not a problem. But yeah, no, I I did discover Caleb Hammer's channel after I discovered the whole genre of envelope budgeting on YouTube, where you don't see a person or an interview or anything like that. You see just a pair of hands on a desk taking a biweekly payroll or monthly earnings in cash and then putting them into little envelopes. And there's this whole cottage industry that has arisen around this with people selling on Etsy, like shops of like their templates for like the little like money holders you can buy and and everything like that. And also even like templates for like forms of budgets and little contests you can create for yourself around saving for different things because the way the envelope budgeting works and in fact we actually do something kind of similar is you every time you get a paycheck put like a certain amount of money toward like this is for fun this is for travel this is for you know insurance this is for bills this is for whatever and you only spend money that you have which is what we do (laughs) just in bank accounts but but I would I just want to say like the 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 rise of these types of YouTube channels where like a lot of people are just watching other people 
carefully budget their money or other people build extremely disciplined financial plans is growing. And I find it interesting because these are people with runaway hedonism. You can see it in like, because I mean, on, on Caleb Hammer's channel, he'll like go through people's credit card statements and go through everything, like their waxing appointments, each restaurant they'll go to. He'll like, and he'll shit on the restaurants. He'll be like, in and out burger? Like, you can't afford this. And what a shitty burger. You know, like he just gets really, really riled up. It's very entertaining. I don't understand how people afford restaurants. Like, I don't. This is something that Simone and I have talked about. There are the few things that like people, like there's institutions in our society that I see. And I'm like, we, you know, we have, we have I make a decent amount of money. Not not like a ton, a ton, but like we're okay. And we live in an area that is, you know, not not like the most expensive area, right? So I'm like, how how in this area that is not a particularly wealthy area, are there like restaurants? Like who is going to a restaurant? Like I don't get it. I can yeah, understand can going to a that. restaurant maybe like once every three months, but like I, that's clearly not happening. And then bars, why would you go to a bar? How do bars even work? In like the suburbs where we live, I mean, clearly you can only get to it by driving. How are you getting home? Is everybody taking a cab home? No, they're taking Ubers. Ubers. Like home? also, like I'm getting these insights into how people live by like seeing the financial statements on this show. So I also find it this amazing slice of life show because you're seeing how people live through the way they spend their money. But it is interesting. I mean, one, no, people can't afford this. Two, we are in a society that's just pervaded by runaway hedonism where people cannot even bring themselves to think about the future and the pain that they're giving to their future selves. I mean, like the constant theme on Caleb Hammer's channel is you're going to die on a Walmart floor. Like, you know, <laughs> like this is, this is bad. Like you have no retirement, you are completely screwed and you're in insane debt. And yet these people like who frequently come in for follow-ups don't, don't change their behavior, but, but, but there's this growing interest in austerity, which is why I think you're really astute to say there's this increasing interest in austerity because there totally is. And people are watching this and people are going on the show. Like they, they see these plans and they find them very appealing. I think in a very similar way that people find like trad wifery very appealing. Well, I, I mean, I, I want to elevate an idea here that you often tell me about how you think about this. Like when you are uh, denying yourself something in the present to indulge in it in the future, whether that is saving or anything like that. And it can be a moral indulgence, like you indulge in giving it away or spending it on, on our projects to try to make the world a better place. And because we don't actually really donate to external charities. We only donate to charities we manage because she has worked in external charities and she doesn't believe that they're efficacious at all. But we do you know, give away a significant amount of our money to our charities and stuff like yeah. that. And what you say is, well, I'm not really Simone in the future, right? Like, but I'm okay with sacrificing now for that person, for Simone in the future. And with the urban monoculture, this progressive movement, there's this idea, and we've talked about this with like the Hayes movement and stuff like that. Like, why is it bad to tell a fat person being fat is unhealthy, even though that would help them in the long term to like accept yeah. this as a reality, like a yeah. obvious reality. And it's because it causes pain in the moment. And it is a cultural system that has elevated their in the moment identity over their future identity. Mm -hmm. But what's really interesting about this elevation versus the people who do make sacrifices in the present for their future selves, if for, for their ability to act in society, is that these two people are showing how they themselves judge them fu their future selves. Yeah. So the individual who is okay with letting themselves die on a Walmart floor so that they can do whatever they want now, they are doing that because they don't care about that future version of themselves. They no, have, okay, no, 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 no. Hold, on, hold on, hold on. Just let me finish this thought, okay? <laughs> they don't care about that. They do not admire that future iteration of themselves. They don't see it as something great or good or worth investing in. Whereas for you or me, the future version of ourselves is always better than the current version of ourselves if we are doing everything right. And therefore more deserving of the sacrifices our present self is making than our present self would be if we indulged in those things. Now, what were you going to say? Pushing back, there is research that has looked at how people plan for the future and like the, the extent to which they're willing to commit to their future selves. And a lot of it just has to do with priming. And I think what's going on is people are literally not thinking about their future selves. They're just, they're like, I, I cannot, 
I cannot think about that. I think a lot of this is about contextualization. So I will dig up those studies and send them to you and we can include links in the in the description because it is interesting how just getting people to think about themselves in the future or see pictures of themselves in the future can get people to be like, oh, <laughs> wait, well, I actually care. It's interesting that you mentioned this. So something that I've seen talked about a lot recently is like the growing normalization of suicidal ideation. Hmm. But before I go down that route, people are probably wondering what I'm snacking on, and it is actually relevant to the topic of this video. This is cheese. Oh, My fancy <laughs> cheese. Mm. But I got one of my fancy cheeses. And it is actually, I mean, it tastes enormously fancy. Hold the mic right? to your, well, hold on. Hold the mic to your mouth. You, you have to like, you're not talking but, to your mic. Sorry. It tastes enormously fancy to me at least, but, and, and, it, and it, it has this level of hedonism to it that in a historic time period would have been considered like the most indulgent of hedonisms. Yet within our time period, it is something that people look at and they're like, that's a fairly cheap cheese. You know, that's a what? That lasts you like a few days and that's a $4 cheese. You know, like well, what, what, how, how is that hedonism, right? And it, it's hedonism in its complexity. Like if you're talking about it versus going out to get like a nice burger or something, an artisan cheese is always going to have more complexity of flavor. It's going to have more punch. It's going to be better calorically. It's going to be better financially for you. And this is also something I was thinking about in terms of the way that people indulge in unique flavors and stuff like that is many of the uh, sort of categories of food that you can indulge in with unique behave flavors are either enormously expensive, like cocktails, unless you're making them at home, and, and, and also alcoholic, or wines, which are alcoholic, or whiskeys, which are alcoholic, or beers, which are alcoholic. And yet, there, there's not as many in the non Talk into the mic. There's not as many in the non-alcoholic categories. It, but, but and just about cheeses, so people understand how people used to relate to cheeses. Because I studied medieval Scottish history when I was at St. Andrews, a university in Scotland, where so I did my undergrad. And they used to collect taxes in cheese because it was a, a portable luxury good that people could make and store for long times in a sort of distributed area. Mm, similar to how the Mayans collected cacao beans and there were even counterfeit cacao beans. Yes. Well, and I just love that I'm eating basically gold money. from the historic money. context that is much more flavorful and complex and nuanced in many meals. And this is also what I'm thinking of with hedonism is people elevate the forms of hedonism, which gives them status within their society, you mm -hmm. know, that can be used for, for social status or that remove effort from them. Instead of the forms of hedonism, like when you're being intentional about hedonism, like I want to indulge in a complex flavor that is very sharp, and very, you know, overwhelming, like artisanal cheeses work great for that. You don't actually need to go out and do all of this other stuff, which is really interesting. That's funny. I thought you were eating our Easter candy because we have these beautiful candy jars down in our kitchen full of Easter themed candy. But little does anyone it's know. It's all from last year. Yes. Okay, so people should know all of our Easter candy. Every time after a holiday, we have it marked whenever everything goes on sale. <laughs> And we go out and we buy all the like extra Halloween candy. And then we buy enough to last us to Easter. And then at the end of Easter, we buy enough for, 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 for next year. But most of the Easter stuff we have out now is all, actually all of it is all from last year. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of these uh, holiday candies, they don't expire for a long time. But now I want to talk about su su suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. And the role, one thing that I, I, I hear in these Gen Z and Gen Alpha videos, especially from like leftist influencers, and it is apparently now becoming pretty common. And this is especially true in the context of now that they're beginning to accept like pronatalism as a real concern. And they're like, look, when people are like, what are you going to be doing when you're old? And they just plan to end it before then. They're like, I'll do what I can now to be happy. But the truth is, is I don't have savings. I don't have kids. There's not really a point to live after a certain point in my life. And historically in our society, this is not something we ever had. 
you know, I hear these influencers say really interesting things and it shows how twisted our society has become. So hmm. when, when they were talking about, well, there was a mental health crisis, right? And this influencer was saying, I'll see if I can find the video to link to it here. I think it's a very complex conversation as to why Gen Z is not wanting to have kids because it doesn't just pertain to financial issues or inflation eating out our asses clean. But Gen Z has a rampant problem with mental health issues that have gone long unaddressed. Mostly for the reason being that the mental health system is largely lacking. For example, I am still on a wait list to see a psychologist. It has been what, eight months? Nine months? I can't even remember the last time that I even followed up on that. Because the last time I did, I remember calling the psychologist and he's on the phone like, well, I'm actually leaving for holidays next week, so we're going to be pretty backed up. I'll give you a call in a few weeks' time. I said, Save the day in my phone and everything like that. I never got a call. So a week later, I called them again and I was like, hey, just following up, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually, no, we don't have any appointments available until mid December. This was in, I think, June last year. Interesting. Well, the way we solved the mental health crisis is we, we, it's caused by not enough psychologists. That's what the mental health crisis is caused by. We need to have oh more gosh. psychologists, more inexpensively accessible. And here I am being like, okay, so you think that the mental health crisis is unique to Gen Z. Do you realize that like psychologists didn't really even exist at, at like a large scale before like 30 years ago? Like, yeah, yeah, there were some psychologists, but they were incredibly rare and almost nobody went to them. It was much more likely that a person regularly went to a fortune teller than a psychologist. And if you go, you know, the, the Old West or something, I was playing Red Dead Redemption 2 recently, which I think is a, an interesting depiction of the Old West. Or, you know, when we read the story about my ancestors, you know, the, the, the account of their life in the episode of people used to like their parents. You know, these were not people where anyone would go to a psychologist. And yet they had enormously better mental health than individuals today. It is this self-indulgence which is causing these negative externalities. I mean, it genuinely worries me that somebody could build up half a million followers and still have takes that are so uneducated and so ungrounded from reality to accurately note that yes, mental health does have something to do with why people aren't having kids anymore, but then to think that it's due to there not being enough psychologists to have no historical context to know that the psychology industry is a completely modern phenomenon that correlates with the mental health crisis, i.e. it appears that the mental health crisis is a result of too many psychologists and psychologists like thinking, invading mainstream discussions of dealing with mental health instead of just nutting up, which is what we used to do, which it turns out is a much more psychologically healthy way to deal with the challenges in your life than to medicalize it and to externalize it and to believe you need to see this sort of secular confessionary class. But also it's, it's an indulgence in a lifestyle and in a cultural system that doesn't really have a plan because the cultural system is so optimized for in the moment hedonism it doesn't really have a plan for the future and when people begin to realize this there is two things they can do they can go against their cultural group they can go up and say hey maybe these religious weirdo rightists people like the Collinses, who we say have made up some weird cult for their family it's like why would they do that why would they recreate religion for our family and it's like because it's other things the alternative and it is not working it is obviously not working and i think that's really interesting because in history we've never seen this hmm. in history we've never seen uh, a world in which a lot of society was just like yeah after my like golden years you know after i hit 30 or 35 i'm it's, it's over for me i'm not really planning for past that stage yeah and, and i mean although i guess there were people who were like very happy to go out and die in war. So I don't know if that's... Yeah, but they were dying thing. for something bigger than themselves. They were, yeah. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And if you've sort of seen this nihilism that's become so common within this generation. I think I see more of the examples of the interest in austerity, but then of course, failure to follow through on it, which is what I find really interesting because it's not just showing up in like financial niches or people getting into being 
a trad wife or whatever, think about all the weird diet, like health diets that are so big, you know, going keto, going paleo or intermittent fasting is so popular now. People are doing cold plunges. Like it's becoming very high class to have a cold plunge pool to, you know, really carefully diet, maybe with the help, help of Ozempic, but like people are actually successfully losing weight now. It seems to be also that austerity, even among the very well resourced, is a status signaler. So it's not just picking up, I think, because people well are realizing- well resourced. I love your word, your wording here. <laughs> no, but it is a status brain. signaler. It is a status signaler. And we're increasingly seeing this. So when you look at like the tech nerd bro culture, and you look at like the wealthiest people in the world, you know, you can look at Sam Bakeman Freed, for example, who was one of the wealthiest people in the world for a while. And he would constantly attempt to signal his austerity. Now he was really bad at it. I mean, he succumbed to hedonism more. I can't believe anyone believed that he would actually had any level of austerity when he couldn't even resist playing video games and board meetings. But I mean, talk about succumbing to in the moment hedonism like a maniac. But then the other person who I think actually does live with a level of austerity is Elon Musk. At least he aspires to live with some austerity. I won't say that he succeeds in it, but you see this in his documentaries and stuff like this, this aspiration to live a degree of austerity. Yeah, like when he sort of decided to not have a home for a long time. But I don't know, he might be a good example of the interplay between those two things, right? Because he still does pretty hedonistic things. And like, I think in the biography on him by Walter Isaacson, there was this one part where I think he started intermittent fasting and like dieting really carefully. But then he wasn't like quite going all the way. Like then he'd like go to a fast food joint and get really shitty food because he'd be like, yeah, this is my one like window where I can eat. That means I can eat anything I want. So I think that he's, I mean, he is the everyman. Like I think a lot of people identify with Elon Musk because he's like the id of a certain segment. Well, um, like, he sort of reminds me of the Simpsons episode where Homer Simpson gains a lot of power and he gets to design a car and he puts domes all over it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> to represent, just like, like the, the, the Tesla man. has a, a fart noise in the passenger seat it does yeah can turn it on so when they sit down it makes a fart noise um because like i said elon musk represents the id of a certain incredibly yeah. intelligent but also very think about what he's signaling with that which is a lack of pretension he gets jokes he knows how to have fun no no but what i'm saying is it's is he's signaling by allowing stuff like that a lack of pretension which is in itself a status signal yeah to say, I don't need pretension to signal status to other individuals. And I, I mean, you get the impression he genuinely finds it funny too and is doing it because he can. <laughs> so they, but of course, the, many things can be true at the same time. But yeah, no, I, I, I do think that it's becoming cool to be austere. And that the to me, the fact that it seems that more people are interested in austerity than are actually practicing it or apparently capable of practicing it implies to me that this is more of a status thing than it is a recognition that our current way of life and focus on hedonism is unsustainable. But you imply with the thesis of your argument that that's not true and that we will see a significant number of people genuinely become austere and actually follow through, which I, I do doubt. Think that. I think when you can build austerity into a form of status signaling. Oh. Which I think we are getting close to doing in a society, right? Yeah. I.e., and this is this is one of the 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 problems with many wealth or high status people in the past. You know, you look like an Andrew Tate or something like that, where their lifestyles are most defined <laughs> by a lack of austerity and personal industry, right? That when we redefine, and this is what masculinity used to be, you know, this is what uh, ideal femininity used to be, right? Like there was a masculine form of austerity and a feminine form of austerity. When we redefine these as positive qualities, both in partners and people we look up to and people who we signal boost, which is now possible with these new types of platforms we have and stuff like that. I mean, one of the problems with individuals who elevated austerity, which we talked about in our most recent track, well, depending on when this goes live, it was track four, is that cultural sources that elevate austerity as a thing of goodness are intrinsically at odds and hostile to the wealthy and powerful in our society because it 
devalues the thing that they want to do with that wealth and value. You know, now they've they've reached this role within our society. Now they have all this power. Now they want to use it to do whatever they feel like, right? And if if you assign austerity as a positive a moral metric, well, now you're devaluing those that have power. So you are a threat. Um, and it's really interesting. You even see this in communist systems. Like communists always promote austerity until they have power. And then it's, well, you know, austerity for the, 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 the middle of the population, at least, but certainly not for the people who are running this government. I mean, we need our constant caviar shipments and private boats and military parades. Yeah, well, I think anyone will start to justify, and I see this in the guests on Caleb Hammer's YouTube channel slash podcast all the time, who are like, oh, well, you know, I don't have time to do this. And this is why I get DoorDash all the, like every single day. DoorDash? Um, order out. I don't even like, understand. DoorDash. Who can afford DoorDash? To nobody order can, but you would not believe the number of people who are apparently using it. And, uh, you know, so, but they're like, you know, my time is more valuable. You know, I just don't have time. And I think it's very easy for anyone, no matter how austere or like mission driven they see themselves to be, to, mm -hmm. if they do not keep themselves honest, over time start spending preposterous amounts of money on things that they think are necessary and fully appropriate that really are not. I think what's interesting is, is if there could be some way where we can tie austerity becoming a status signaler with the kind of actually effective interventions that cause people to start serving their future selves, which has been found in this research of like actually thinking about your future self more, contextualizing yourself as part of this, this unbroken mm -hmm. chain of people, that we could actually see some really positive change. For example, like on a regular basis, you know, I like waddle around the house talking mm -hmm. to myself all the time. Like she's I'm a crazy always... person. You guys don't know this. She's just bat insane. <laughs> <And you saw her. laughs> <laughs> I believe the correct and technical term is batshit crazy, not bat insane, Malcolm Collins. Okay, wait, wait, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I actually, I need to look into the origin of, the, of that. Like, is there maybe something like associated with a madness related disease related to accidentally ingesting fecal matter from bats? I'm going to have uh, to look this up. For anyone wondering, it comes from the term bats in the belfry, which was, uh, belfry is a part of a church and when it wasn't in use, it would get bats in it. And that was like, your brain's not in use, they were saying. And then people in modern times just added the word shit to it because it sounds awesome. Oh, yeah, actually. Right. Bad shit crazy. Um, anyway, but anyway, so I will walk around the house and like if, if, for example, like, you know, something has been like prepped for me by my past self, I'll be like, oh, thank you, past Simone. Like, wow, past Simone was awesome. And then I will take a lot of pride in like setting things up for like Simone of tomorrow morning to make sure that she has an easier morning. Well, and you then often send letters to these different iterations of yourself, addressed to different iterations of yourself. Yeah. Where she really fully, this is even before we met, sees herself at different frames of time as entirely different people. But I'm always working in service to future Simones, but also thinking back to past Simones and thinking like, wow, she like deserves a lot of praise and credit for really setting me up well. And I think if people contextualize that more into their lives and started seeing their lives like that, they, they would start to actually gain genuine hedonic satisfaction from austerity because austerity is almost always an action or a sacrifice that's taken in favor of the future. Well... Uh, to, to, for the audience who may have struggled with like what you're talking about here, it's like the ship of Theseus thought experiment, you know, like boards fall off of the ship over time and they're replaced over time. When it gets to the final port, it has none of the original boards. Is it a different ship or is it the original ship? Uh, you are basically taking the answer of every time a board falls off, it's meaningfully a new ship, but the, it's, it's also meaningfully part of a continuum of ships and, and, and therefore it's serving the future interests of the yeah, ship. What, what I'm serving, like any conscious moment of my life, is the mission of transporting my cargo, my people, whatever, like the, it, it's not about the, the material composition of the ship. It is about the act of conveying passengers or cargo from one port to another. And, and I think when people contextualize themselves as that and seeing themselves in service to that, then it's very different. And again, I, <laughs> please remind me to send you those studies so you can see like it does really affect people's decision-making. Well, I love you and I love your crazy show shows. And if you wanted to end on a thought, you could end on the craziest thing that people have overindulged in. Yeah, on the show. 
Oh God. Honestly, no, it's really mundane stuff. It is literally just DoorDash restaurants, cars, and sometimes travel. But it's, it is, that's the thing is like, if it'd be one thing, if it was like, oh, you know, I bought, you know, a, a yacht that was, you know, stranded in the misert, middle of the desert and I was going to create a resort around it, you know, like something crazy. Right. But it's never that it's so basic. It's anyway. Starbucks. I, well, that's, and that's what it is, is that they're wasting money on things that aren't even inspired and not even Sad. crazy. Sad. I, yeah. I love you to death, Simone. And often the people who waste their money on crazy things, they tend to make it back again. I've noticed that's true well and that's that's elon musk right like he's blown his money on insanely insanely risky investments and what's what's the the problem with these people who may end up being perpetually poor is that they pretty much always spend their money on what caleb hammer describes as taquitos which is just like dumb impulse buys like you go into a 7-eleven and you buy taquitos and he'll just like go through people's statements and be like taquitos 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 and that's the thing so yeah i kind of like that's an interesting maybe Someday, even if we have enough to flush that out, a topic for a future podcast is the difference between, you know, like dumb spending versus dumb spending. <laughs> All right. I love you to death, Simone. I love you too, gorgeous.